Welcome to another online program from the Adams County Historical Society. My name is Antigone Ladd, and I am particularly pleased to host this program where I get to introduce you to a gentleman who is a member of the greatest generation. You will meet Clem Leone, a World War II veteran, who also is a history lover, and he is a marvelous storyteller. He will share tales from his experiences in war, his training, his family background, and his capture and time in a German prisoner of war camp. I only wish I had been the one to do this interview, but credit for that goes to two gentlemen, Jerry Royals and Joe Richard. So let's step back in time and meet a young Clem Leone, whom you see pictured here on the bottom left with his flight crew. Clem is originally from Baltimore, Maryland. He lived in Gettysburg for many years. He is now living in Hanover, Pennsylvania. Here is Clem, just out of training and ready to head off to Europe. Let's hear his story as told to Jerry and Joe. I'm Jerry Royals and I'm sitting here in the study of Clem Leone, who is part of the greatest generation, having been involved in World War II and then having finished out his career in the military. And uh, we're in Clem's, as you can see, eventually a, a study here that he has put together a great deal of memorabilia, and we'll be discussing it today and talking with Clem about some of his recollections of his service career and things that stood out as significant to him throughout his life, actually. Uh, Clem, how about starting off and just saying uh, kind of where you grew up and how you happened to get up into the U.S. Army and then the Army Air Corps? Well, I was born in Baltimore, Baltimore, Maryland, and uh, I was a senior when uh, Pearl Harbor was attacked. And uh, like all the other guys in the class, anxious to get into the service, but mom had other ideas, so uh, she wouldn't let me join. And uh, she did promise that if uh, they ever start drafting 18-year-olds, that then she'd let me go. So as soon as they said they were going to draft 18-year-olds, I was right back to mom, and she said, all right, if that's what you want to do, do it. She signed your papers, huh? Right. So, uh -huh. so I enlisted in the uh, Army Air Corps, and, uh, uh, and at, at that time, uh, well, I wasn't very large, uh, five and a half feet. I think I weighed every bit of about 124 pounds, <laughs> and everybody was t kidding me, asked me what what was I want to be a tail gunner, you know, and uh -huh. and it, it gave me ideas because I did want to fly. Yeah. And Mom said uh, uh, she let me enlist with the promise that I wouldn't fly. Oh, would not fly. Would not fly. And, and I told her that that was good unless they made me. Uh huh. And so she that was agreeable. And, uh, well, as we go on, I'll show yeah. you why I well, started to fly. When, they, when you but, first got enlisted, uh, when did you actually enter the service, and where did you enter? I, right I, in Baltimore? I entered the service in Baltimore uh -huh. in the November of 42. Okay. When I graduated from the radio course, that automatically gave me a promotion to corporal. Uh-huh. Now, I forget how much more that was. It probably was about but, seven bucks. <laughs> but, but that meant, again, having stripes cut off yep. and new stripes put on, mm -hmm. which was fine. But they said that anyone that could pass the physical would uh, have to go to aerial gunnery school because they were in need of uh, uh, radio operators. And uh, so uh, next thing you know, I'm heading for Harlingen, Texas. So <laughs> here went all my winter uniforms yeah, yeah. again and back to the summer uh -huh. uniforms again. And uh, so we had, a, I think it was a six-week gunnery course at Harlingen, uh -huh. uh, uh, both air-to-air -air gunnery and uh, ground gunnery, basics of uh, lead and what have you. And, a little uh, weapons orientation right. also. Mm -hmm. And uh -huh. uh, uh, the caliber 50s primarily. Yeah. And, uh, but we had skeet shooting, uh, trap shooting, and uh, uh, mounted shotguns on uh, turrets so that uh -huh. we could learn how to operate the various turrets, turrets. on the uh, on the They cross-trained you on all of the, yes. the systems within all, the all bomber aircraft. Right, right, the nose, tail, ball, uh -huh. upper, the whole, the whole works. Uh -huh. and, uh, so then when I graduated from gunnery school, uh, they shipped me to Ogden, Utah, okay. where I was assigned to a crew. 
Did they, they have aircraft there? Or just they had crew? aircraft there, B-24s uh -huh. there. B-24s. Uh, they were just making up the crews. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was assigned there as a, an assistant radio operator on a B-24. Uh, this meant another stripe. So okay. I now had uh, four You're getting the big bucks here. I now had four <laughs> stripes. Uh, two weeks later, they decided they didn't have enough radio operators to have a, a radio operator and an assistant. So they made me radio operator. And that gave me another strike. <laughs> so uh, in 11 months, I'd gone from uh, recruit to uh, a, uh, a sergeant first class. And then I was making big bucks. You told them you were a good man right, and you deserved right, it, right? $114 <laughs> a month. That's okay. That was pretty good <laughs> right. back then. But then we went on to, we got to start getting flying pay. Uh -huh. And that was half again of our base pay. So that was another $57. Uh -huh. So. We were really living it up, mm -hmm. and uh, and then from uh, there we went to uh, Sioux City, Iowa, and uh, for uh, transition training, mm -hmm. and we did a lot of uh, practice bomb runs uh, from Sioux City out to Wyoming and dropped on the bombing ranges there at 100 pounds. It was kind of like bombing. crew training, was crew it? Crew training, yeah. yes. With your aircraft, with your with our aircraft and our crew, uh -huh. yes. And uh, how then, big was your crew? Uh, ten man crew. Ten man crew. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Five. Uh, uh, let's see. One, two, four enlisted. And six. I mean, six enlisted. And four officers. Uh -huh. And uh, pilot, co-pilot, navigator, and bombardier were officers. Okay. And the other six of us were gunners. Technicians, etc. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We had a, a tail gunner, two waist gunners, ball turret gunner, upper turret gunner, and radio operator. You were all kind of cross-trained on all of the gun systems? Well, not all of us. I oh. think just the engineer and myself were uh -huh. cross-trained oh, on okay. all of them. And the rest uh, of them just got assigned to a weapon. Yeah. More or less. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure they had familiarization on them. Yeah. But, uh, and uh, so then they gave me a six-day furlough and took me two days. Right. <laughs> two days to get home, uh -huh. two days at home, two days to get back. And when I got back, the outfit was gone. Your whole the whole out, the whole field was empty. Uh huh. And uh, all planes gone. Also? All the planes were gone. Uh -huh. and the MPs were there, and they uh, after showed your orders, they said, "Well, report to a certain uh, barracks, and the plane would be coming in to pick us up." And so those of us that were on leave, uh huh. So they picked us up and took us to Macon, Georgia, and there we met our the, our crew again. The same crew same that crew you we had. With. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And from there we went to uh, I don't I don't recall the name of the field in Florida, mm -hmm. and uh, received their uh, overseas orders and uh, sealed orders, and we're told the pilot was told to take off and take a, a certain heading, and at a certain time to open the sealed orders and mm -hmm. then tell him where he was heading, and uh, so that was from Florida to uh, uh, Natal, Brazil. Uh -huh. And uh, on that tr trip, we were using so much fuel that we had to s stay there an extra week while they checked out the pilot to see if the pilot wasn't handling the controls correctly or yeah, whether the plane enough, was huh? just uh, sucking up too much fuel. Uh -huh. And it turned out the plane was just using too much fuel, so they had to install uh, Bombay tanks, uh, extra Ferry tanks. Yeah. Yeah, tanks. Mm -hmm. And uh, you were going somewhere where you needed a longer distance right. to get. Right, so we took off from Brazil and uh, headed for the Ascension Island, uh, which is halfway between Brazil and Africa. You had a good navigator, I hope. That's, that was the first thought that entered <laughs> my mind. All of us were just out of school, yeah. and I hope that he had done his lessons yeah, as well. I was going to say, a bunch of young guys right. putting their faith in one man. Right, it's just a little dot on the map. Yeah. You know, and yep. so fortunately we found it. We landed uh, at the Ascension on uh, Thanksgiving Day uh -huh. and had a nice Thanksgiving dinner there. And, uh, uh, did they, you fly as a single aircraft or did you have a aircraft. formation? Single, single. aircraft. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there we went to uh, Marrakech, North Africa. Mm -hmm. And from Marrakech we skirted the, co uh, the coast up to uh, England, up to our base in uh, Tibbenham, England. Where is that located? Uh, it was just south of London. Just south of London. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, then from there we started more training. Uh, was we were assigned to a squadron or a wing uh, when you were there? Well, we were assigned to a group. A group, right? Okay. Uh, Second Air Division, uh, 440, 445th Bomb Group. 445. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we started a lot of formation practice and yeah. uh, so forth. And 
About how many aircraft do you think were on the field? At the time? Oh golly, I would say probably at least thirty, uh -huh. uh, possibly more. Yeah. And uh, I might uh, might mention that uh, that the four forty fifth. That's the same outfit that Jimmy Stewart was in. Uh huh. Uh, I was in the seven hundred squadron. He was in the seven hundred first. Uh huh. And uh, at the I, same field. At the same field. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. And I I did. Uh, well, I see him riding around on his bicycle all the time. That's uh -huh. all we used to ride around the base. He didn't solicit you to be part of his uh, no. Hollywood career. No, <laughs> <laughs> I flew with him one time. He was checking uh -huh. out a new a new pilot, uh -huh. and uh, the, the, his the, the group was on a mission, and he needed a radio operator to go with him to check out this pilot. So he came over to our squadron, wanted to know any radio operators that wanted to get some flying time, and so I volunteered. Oh, wow! And uh, had one flight with him. But, and uh, he got you back safely, obviously. Well, we didn't just flew across England. I mean, we didn't uh -huh. go on a combat mission. Okay. Yes, I got back safely. Uh -huh. So. Oh, good. That's a, that's interesting. Yes. You know, Jack, mm -hmm. you got to meet the, right. a very famous person in yes. our time. Right. Yeah. And then. Uh, uh, Did you start missions at that time after you uh, completed your formation well, no, training? Well, our, no. Uh, our pilot uh, uh, got some kind of sickness. I don't know what kind it was, but they had to hospitalize him. So they started uh, splitting us up and putting us on as replacement crews uh, any time there was a mission going out. And it seemed like every time they put one of us on a uh, crew, that crew would abort. Something would happen that they wouldn't go. <laughs> yeah. So finally the CO said, enough of this is enough. So he gave us a, another pilot. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, December 29th, taking a familiarization flight with this new pilot. We had uh, some problems with the aircraft, engine caught fire, mm. and uh, tried to extinguish it, and it went out, and uh, we're uh, trying to get ready to make a landing, and it caught up again very bad, and the pilot gave us a signal to bail out. So we started uh, bailing out over England, and uh, the, I went out at 800 feet, didn't know it at the time. That's a pretty uh, low jump. Right, I counted to 10, uh -huh. Pulled the ripcord, looked over, saw the engineer in his chute, looked to see how high I was, and hit. Yeah. Broke my leg. And, oh, uh, did you? Yeah, very, uh -huh. very lucky that I didn't break everything. Yeah, I was going to say, because that, <laughs> that's a quick, just, low jump. Just, I was just about treetop height when the chute fully inflated. Mm. So, uh, so you joined the Caterpillar Club early. Right. <laughs> and uh, But then I they x-rayed it, it was just the, uh, I think they called it the... Uh, tibula, tibula. Or, mm -hmm. and uh, so all they did was put a soft cast bandage on it and said fit for duty. Put your flying boots right. back on, you'll never know, right? So <laughs> limp, limped out to the plane, went on our first mission. This is a uh, summer summer uniform, summer flying suit uh, that we used. Uh, uh, this is a, uh, my uh, squadron identification uh, at insignia. Uh, when we flew at high altitude, we wore the summer flying helmet which had the earphones for the radio built in. Uh, we wore goggles and we had the oxygen mask. When we got above 10,000 feet, we had to use oxygen. And we had a throat mic to keep our hand free. Uh, being radio operator, uh, I had to have my hand free to use the uh, telegraph key for Morse code. Uh, if I used voice communication, the throat mic was all I needed. Uh, in addition to this, we also had uh, the uh, uh, winter uh, suit that was under underneath this, if we were going real high, that uh, was a uh, electric that we could plug into the plane and had a rheostat on it so that we could get some w warmth. And uh, so uh, in combat, we wouldn't use this. We would use, uh, first we would put on our uh, long johns, then we'd put on that uh, electric heated suit then we put on a regular uniform. Now on top of the uniform, we'd put on our leathers, which were leather uh, pants and a leather jacket, use a winter cap, a winter flying helmet, uh, leather gauntlets, leather boots. And on top of that, we'd wear our uh, uh, parachute harness, uh, then our May West. And uh, on top of the May West, then we put a flak suit. And, uh, uh, we had all this equipment. We put all this on before we got in the aircraft. And when we get waddled out to the aircraft, that's literally what we did was waddle. 
because it had all this weight on us. We could just about fit through that bomb bay door to get up to the to our uh, assigned position. We went on our first mission uh, to Frankfurt, Germany. And, that was a hot mission. Then. Right, Frankfurt, Frankfurt on the Rhine. Yeah. Yep, and uh, and everything was fine. Uh, a lot of flak, a little bit of fighter, but uh, primarily flak. And got over to target, uh, dropped their bombs, and. Uh, you know, well, this isn't half bad of what I thought it would be. Mm -hmm. uh, as we were turning off the target, one plane did not get his bombs out. And of course, uh, as you're making a turn on the target, your planes go over top of each other. And uh, as he kicked his bombs out, one of them hit our number three engine and knocked it clear out of the airplane right over the target. Just took it right Took down. it right out, just a big gap and hole. You were and, fortunate. Yes. And that, that happened to be the one right outside the window of my radio. I mean, so I look out and all I see is this big hole in a wing. What did you say, Skipper? We we're missing an engine. It just disappeared. Right. So, uh, of course, we had to drop out of formation. Uh -huh. And my thought then was, wouldn't you know it? You see all those planes heading back to England. Now, if they'd have waited for us, we could have all got back, yeah. you know. But here you we could, are struggling along yeah, by ourselves. you couldn't keep up with only right. three engines. Right. And did you uh, go back low level, or how did you, uh, how'd you work that? Well, we had to start uh, dropping down, and uh -huh. uh, we had an overcast, fortunately. And uh, next thing you know, uh, number one engine went out. Uh, it had been hit by flak, and we didn't know it, but uh -huh. uh, all of a sudden it just malfunctioned and quit. So they put us on two engines, and uh, again, the only thing I think that saved us was the overcast. Uh, when we got uh, Pretty close to uh, what uh, the navigator thought might be the channel, he asked me to get a position report. So I uh, called in for a triangulation, and they called back the position we, after we identified ourselves. Mm -hmm. They called back where we were, and we were over Pas de Calais, France. Oh, okay. uh, and uh, you know, I called it up to the navigator, and he says, "Well." Uh, that puts us right over Pas de Calais, and he no sooner said that than there was a break in the clouds, and we, we were now at about uh, 8,000 feet. And man, they opened up with us with those flat guns. You could uh -huh, almost uh -huh. you could almost see the gunners, you, you know. Yeah, you could see the uh, black puffs coming. Right, <laughs> and you could see the guys. I mean, you could, could see you, the flashes. Yeah, well, 8,000, yeah, you could see the. So with a little, you know, evasive action, uh -huh. uh, we dropped a few more thousand. So we at I guess about uh, 4,000 feet then, yeah. and. Uh, uh, did you have to dump anything? Ev anything and did. everything. Throwing out all the, all the guns out, and everything. Uh, say 50 rounds per gun. Uh -huh. Threw all the ammunition out. Threw out all my radio tuning units. Uh, broke out the auxiliary generator. Threw that out. And, uh, even tried to break the ball turret out of it. <laughs> Got it broken halfway out, but couldn't get couldn't it out get of it all the aircraft. Drop. <laughs> mm. So uh, then we get the. Uh, at that point. I, I was put in the upper turret because the engineer had to be down. Yeah. And I uh, hear fighters at six o'clock. Uh, swing the guns around. There's two 109s coming in fast, and uh, so they were way out. So waiting for them to get in range, and I hear fighters at twelve. So I whip around to the twelve o'clock position. Two Spitfires. Thank goodness. Because we were just <laughs> over the channel at right. that point, and they engaged the they took care of that. 109s. Uh -huh. And uh, right behind them was some kind of an aircraft, I don't know, a twin-engine aircraft that had a big lifeboat on the on the belly of it. Huh, like a rescue craft. A rescue guess, craft, yeah. in case we'd gone down in uh -huh. the channel and then dropped the boat to us. You'd glad to see the Brits that time, oh, yes. weren't you? <laughs> oh, yes. And, uh, and then they uh, uh, get a call from a base station that wants to change our frequency on our identification <laughs> friend or foe set uh -huh. uh, to a certain channel. When, so I had to go back, because that was way in the back of the aircraft. Uh -huh. So I had to go back there and switch it over to the channel they said. And at that point, the two spits were right on us, ready to knock us down. If that didn't give them the signal they wanted. Oh, really? Because uh -huh. a lot of times they'd take a, a plane and, you know, if it crash landed, they'd patch it up. Mm -hmm. And they'd come up in your Germany, formation. Germans and everything bogus else. Right. Yeah. Uh -huh. So once that was okay, then they just swung in on our wing and brought you home. In. But as we were coming in, the uh, pilot was having trouble getting airspeed for landing. So he says, anybody wants to bail out, you know, you can jump. We're, we're over England, so if you want to jump, you can. And so 
person said, what are you going to do? He said, well, I'm going to bring this thing in. Okay, well, we'll stay with you. Ride with it, huh? So, uh, you already had your experience right. jumping. <laughs> and I was right there, you know, right behind the pilot. So I'm hearing him tell the co-pilot, he says, all right, uh, we'll throw it in a dive, he says, and uh, uh, when I tell you, throw the landing gear down. We don't have time to check it for locking. He says, throw it down and hope it locks. And he says, Leone, fire up a couple of red flares. And uh, so red flare meant either wounded aboard or you're coming in. Just Got get that runway clear. Yep, yep. <laughs> and fortunately, uh, we gear came able down, to kiss it down for locked, you, and he got it down. Uh -huh. And the uh, CO okay. came out, and he was hot as a firecracker when he saw that airplane. Uh -huh. Why didn't you uh, put it on automatic and head it back to Germany? He says, I'll never be able to get a plane to replace that thing. <laughs> <laughs> So that was our first mission. Yeah. So that, that was an exciting first baptism mission. Baptism by fire. Yeah, yes. definitely that. Right. You know, say, did they scrap the plane and yeah, they scrapped issue it, yeah. a new one? Yeah, they never got it. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, with having <laughs> torn out an engine, right. it's kind of difficult yeah. to repair. Right. Well, Clem, after your first mission, uh, how many more missions did you have? Well, I actually only had four and a half more. Four and a half? For a total of five, that, five and a half. What does that half mean? Well, that half means we got halfway in. <laughs> had to walk back. <laughs> had to walk back. Okay. Yeah, we were heading uh, on a mission to Gotha, uh, Messerschmitt factory, uh -huh. and uh, we just crossed the uh, the channel over Holland, and it just crossed into Germany when we got jumped. By uh, jumped by uh, uh, Focke-Wulf 190s. 190s. Uh, right up here, yeah, yeah. and uh, they uh, our escort. Did not show. P 51s were supposed to. Right, and for some reason there was a foul up in communication and they didn't show. Uh, we sent uh, uh, 20 aircraft from our my uh, group uh -huh. on that mission and they knocked down 13 of us. The fighters uh, did. The fighters knocked down 13 of us. Uh, we were probably one of the first to go down and uh, uh, we were hit by. Uh, uh, Pock Wolf 190s, as I said, with a 20 millimeter cannon mm -hmm. fire, and the uh, B B24 being mostly hydraulic, uh, as soon as those 20s hit us, uh, uh, put us right on fire and knocked out practically every oh, operational power. thing on the plane. Yeah. Couldn't open the bomb bays, uh, uh, could, ev everything went out. Yeah. Uh, and the bomb bays, of course, was our bailout position, open the bomb bay doors mm -hmm. and jump. Couldn't open the bomb bays, fire, we were on fire, uh, really on fire. Uh, still, well had our, still had our still had our bombs flash. aboard and flames just crackling around those bombs and uh, the uh, <clears throat> I grabbed the extinguisher to see if I could put it out. Engineer came out of the top turret, grabbed the extinguisher from me to you know, to fight the fire. Uh, then I noticed the co pilot get up, open the upper hatch which is used for uh, 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 ditching. Uh, crashing in the sea, mm -hmm. he opened that and went out the top hatch. Well, my theory has always been pilot or co-pilot leaves, it's time for this boy to go. Mm -hmm. So I grabbed my chute then and I climbed up on the radio uh, table and tried to climb out that top hatch. And it was pretty rough because the uh, plane was going pretty fast and uh, I had my back toward the front of the plane and I had to actually push myself back so I could get the chest chute and lift it up over the aircraft in order to get out of the top hatch. And I grabbed the upper guns and was holding on to the upper uh, turret guns. And then I was wondering if that was a smart move because I had that big old double tail back there and figured if I let go there's a good chance of whap right into that yeah. thing, you know, or could even go off to the side and hit those props that were still running. So while I was trying to make up my mind, the plane exploded, and when it exploded, uh, I well, when I came you to, you went up. <laughs> I came to, and uh, of course, my only thought, fallen, then was the hunt for ripcord, uh -huh. and uh, so I found the ripcord and popped the ripcord. Use the chest chute. Uh, yeah, chest chute, and uh, the uh, uh, chute opened, and uh, then I started looking around and feeling around. I, I had blood all running up at my face and in my hair and everything from the concussion and uh, uh, the plane, uh, I didn't even see the plane. Uh, by the time I really realized what was going on, I saw the, the thing on the ground uh, 
you know, burning. And uh, the uh, I saw the co-pilot. Uh, he was way below me, so I must have been up still probably around 15,000 feet, I guess. And uh, his chute hadn't fully inflated, and he was spiraling in. Hmm. And it uh, seemed like it took me about 15 minutes or so to get down to the ground. Well, you were a pretty light guy, and, right. you know, and, uh, chute canopy wasn't that big. Right. So uh, as I'm coming down, I was heading, heading for what looked like a lake, and I don't swim. <laughs> You mean a Baltimore boy didn't swim right. in the harbor? That's right. <laughs> so my thought right away is, when you know it, I got out of that airplane, I'm going to land right in the middle of that lake and drown. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the sh the chute was oscillating, you know, swaying back mm -hmm. and forth. And uh, of course, our instructions, uh, which all we got was verbal instruction on what to do, was to climb one side of the chute, and that would stop it. So I started climbing the shroud lines, and uh, that tilted the canopy of the chute. And that made it you go down faster. Yeah, it spilled the yeah, air. So I let that go and figure, you know, go ahead and sway. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then as I'm getting lower, I noticed I was coming in backward. So again, cross your arms and grab the light shroud lines again and pull and it'll turn you around. And by God, it worked. That one worked. Huh? Yeah, it worked. So <laughs> now I'm heading in right and I've got it all figured out. I'm going to hit lightly and roll. And... Uh, Next thing I know, the old ground came up much faster than it was coming up before. And yeah. My first thought was, I'm not going to break another leg. So I pulled my legs up, land on my butt, and cracked three ribs. and almost broke my back. We were coming across Holland into Germany. And just as we got into Germany, we got hit. And uh, uh, apparently, uh, the pilot must have turned the plane around because even though we were hit over Germany, we landed, those of us that got out, landed in uh, Holland. Hmm. So I was hurting pretty bad. Yeah, I was going to say, decision, uh, decision. Huh? Right. <laughs> and I saw all these people running toward me. And uh, so it must have been 30 or 40 at least, maybe even 50. An awful lot of people come running toward me. And uh, right away, we'd heard stories about German civilians killing the flyers, uh -huh. you know. And so not not that you're brave, because there's no such thing as being brave. Yeah, you're, I mean, you're in hostile territory. Right. So pull the old 45, you know, and slam around in, figure, take one or two anyway. And uh, then they start yelling, Hollander, Hollander. Well, that uh -huh. was easy enough to figure that they were Dutch. Uh -huh. So I motion them in, and one of them comes in, he, he says, are you blessed? Uh, blessed. I wonder what he means. Yeah. Probably I figure because of all the, you know, blood yeah, and hurt, all that, yeah, he something. probably got yeah. hurt or wounded. And I get my language card out, and I can't find anything on there. Yeah, no Dutch. No, no it's Dutch all German French. No Dutch was on there, but it didn't say anything about bless. Ah. So I figured, well, maybe this is a uh, Catholic country, and uh, he might be asking me something about religion. So in my card, uh, there was something that said, uh, Ich ben Protestant. And so I said, uh, uh, uh -huh. no, ich, ich ben Protestant. And I guess he thought I was crazy, and I thought he was crazy, too. So <laughs> <laughs> we were both in the same... A crazy <laughs> group together. <laughs> right. So anyway, they said, well, uh, come on. They took me up to the farmhouse that was close by uh -huh. and uh, uh, gave me uh, uh, some tea to drink and uh, 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 some kind of bread and made a sandwich. And, and then at that point, this uh, home guard comes in with a rifle, and uh, for you, the war is over. Oh. And, uh, was he a German home guard, or uh, well, did he, you have any? Clue he was what probably he was? he was probably a Dutchman. Uh -huh. but, uh, he had a uniform and uh, and a rifle, uh, but he was definitely a Nazi. Yeah. And uh, so he says, "Come." And uh, so we we'll start down the road, and we come to a uh, uh, some sort of a civilian camp, and he says, "In here," and the Dutch people were all following, and they said, "No, don't go in there," and I said, "No, I, I'm not." going in there. I said, I'm a American soldier. I want to be turned over to the military. He said, well, you're hurting. He says, and I thought it'd be easier here. I said, I want to go to the military. I want the military. He said, okay. And so he says, come again. And so we start down the road again, and we come to a crossroad. And uh, the Dutch people are yelling, go to the left, go to the trees. Well, I'm looking. I don't see any trees. I'm bushes. They look like uh -huh, me. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, so I'm standing there. I, I really don't know what to do. I'm all befuddled. Yeah. How old were you? 19. Yeah, I was going right. to say, <laughs> new experience again. Right, right. so yeah. really befuddled, didn't know what to do. Finally, 
somebody comes up and taps him on the shoulder and says, come. And he took off to the left, and without thinking, I took off behind him. Uh -huh. Then I remembered the guy with the gun. So I turned back to look back at him, and the people had grabbed him and were beating the daylights out of him. Uh -huh. So we go into what they call the woods, had a camouflage to a hole in the ground there, like a cave. Uh -huh. They pulled a cover off of that, put me down in there, and I stayed there for three or four days until the heat got off. And then they, in the middle of the night, we went to a church, and then from a church, uh, hauled me into Amsterdam. Hmm. And uh, at that, how did you get there from there? Did you walk? Well, or we walked. Did you we walked. Have guides? To, we walked to the church, always with a guide. Uh -huh. We always kept a guide with you. And then from the church, they had a. Uh, look like a, a bus of some sort come in. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, at the church, they gave me civilian clothes. And uh, then we got on this bus and went into Amsterdam and uh, uh, went to a private home. And uh, they hid me in the attic of this private home. Hmm. Got me fake papers showing that I was a deaf and dumb uh, uh, accountant from Sumatra. Okay. Sumatra being a Dutch possession, uh -huh. and my complexion being dark, and they're all so fair that, you know, they uh -huh. spot me right away. And so that's, there I was in civilian clothes with my identification. And then they were looking for a safe route to back to Spain to get back to England. Uh -huh. But their, their route had been compromised, and they were trying to find a, a new safe route. Yeah. And they gave me an expression. Uh, uh, to uh, uh, say over the uh, radio that they listened to. They listened to a Radio Orange being broadcast out of England to let the uh, Dutch people know what was going on in the war. Mm -hmm. And I was to tell them that Prickle uh, Rat is on a coming. And, uh, you know, uh, I have a message for my Dutch friends. Prickle Rat is on a coming. And I said, well, what the heck does that mean? And he says, well, it means barbed wire has arrived. He says, and that'll be a code to us that this route that we're sending you on is a safe route to uh -huh. get back. And uh, I never did forget that, though. But yeah, I never the, had to your, use your it. Dutch is pretty good. Right. <laughs> you still got so, it with you. <laughs> so anyway, uh, from there, uh, went uh, across the border from, in the, from Holland into Belgium at night, timed the guards, and then when we got the timing right, when they'd move out one or two, uh, they got uh, five or six of us from different homes uh -huh. And then he, we'd slip all American across, flyers. all Americans, yeah, uh -huh. and, uh, and uh, we'd slip across, and they had people in Belgium waiting for us, and they took us into Antwerp, and uh, in Antwerp they put us up in different homes, and uh, waiting for the contact that was to take us to the to the uh, border of France, and uh, finally they they made the contact, and turned me and one over to this contact, and. Uh, he happened to be a collaborator and turned us into the Germans. Oh. And, uh, was he a Frenchman that turned you in, or uh, well, I guess Belgian? He was Belgian. You know? I guess Belgian. He was Belgian. Uh huh. And uh, how how did that happen? Did they take you to a German? Yeah, he, station he, he says, "Come on." He says, uh, uh, "Now don't worry." He says about uh, where I'm taking you. He says because uh, I've bribed all these people. He says we've got to go this way in order to get you. You know, mm -hmm. you have so, a story all made so up. So we go in through this building with a couple of German guards out in front, you know, and uh, as soon as we got inside, then you knew it, it was all over. Mm -hmm. Then he said, here's another one. Yeah. And uh, Cause So two of you got turned in at the yeah, same time. Right. So you, they... Did you know who the other one was? Did you? Oh, yeah, Odell Hooper. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I remember you his did? name. Yeah, he's from uh, Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Right. He just died recently. Uh-huh. So you stayed so in contact with we him. We stayed together, and they put us both in the same cell uh -huh. in the Antwerp Best uh, Prison <laughs> <laughs> with a, uh, a sack full of straw. And believe me, we had bad bugs that night. We had bad bugs. Uh -huh. I mean, something crawling. It was bad bugs from that straw. And, <laughs> yeah. and uh, I guess we stayed there about a week till they got enough of us together and then hauled us out and put us on the old 40 and 8 cars. And, mm -hmm called us over to, uh, uh, they called it Dulag Luft, which was the interrogation center. I, I forget the location of that in Germany. Mm -hmm. And uh, since we got there, they threw us in solitary for, for a week. And uh, I think they did that so they could see what information they could dig up on us before they called us for the actual interrogation. Mm -hmm. And it, it was kind of humorous. Uh, I came in front of this interrogation officer after a week, and he says, uh, your name? 
drag and serial number. And I gave him that, and he says, uh, Leone, uh, yes. He says, uh, Italian, isn't it? Uh, yes, it is. He says, fighting on the wrong side, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Did this fellow speak good English? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Perfect English. Uh -huh. Yeah, fighting on the wrong side, aren't you? I said, no, I don't think so. He says, well, he says, it's just... Seems strange Italian and, you know, not fighting with the Italians. Uh -huh. And then he, you know, they give you that friendliness bit yeah, yeah. to see what they can get you out get of you. Sure. But he knew everything about me because I'd been with the Dutch underground for four and a half months. Uh -huh. So, you know, it wasn't a recent crash. So they had plenty of time to know that I, I was around somewhere because yeah. they hadn't found my body. Uh -huh. And uh, so... Uh, they probably had a crew list of your original right. crew oh, yeah, somehow. No. Well, he had a, a crew list there, but it wasn't my crew. In fact, it wasn't my plane. And huh. uh, for some reason, they, they fouled up on their intelligence. But uh, uh, he wanted to... I think maybe the holster I had from my first jump, my pistol was in the, my bag. So he gave me another pistol and another shoulder holster, and it had a lieutenant's name on it. Uh -huh. And I think I kind of confused them up in the... Uh, yeah, probably did. Right. From there, they took us by train across Germany on up to Poland. And the camp was right here in Poland, uh, Kroschow, Poland, which is right uh, near the Baltic Sea, as you can see. Good. And that was, camp was uh, Stalag Luft, number four. Full name, Kriegsefangen in Lager der Luftwaffe, number four. Uh, at the in interrogation center, they gave us a capture parcel, the Red Cross capture Red Cross. parcel. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a, a made of a, some sort of fiber, like a suitcase made of fiber. And it had a pajamas and a scuffed bedroom slippers and a pipe and tobacco and uh, mm -hmm. uh, the necessities, the toothbrush, toothpaste, uh, what have you. And uh, when we got to the prison camp, they took them away from us. So <laughs> at least we could carry them from the interrogation say, center you, to the prison You were just camp. a transporter right. in that sense. Yeah. And we were very fortunate that the, when we got off the train, it was uh, about a, a mile from the camp. Uh -huh. And they had these uh, uh, guards uh, lined up all, all along the route that they took us uh, from the train to the camp. Were they German and or were they Ger Romanian? Young, young Germans. Young Germans. And, uh, uh, had police dogs, uh, German, uh -huh. I guess German shepherds, what else? Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, they made us run, and uh, as we were running, they uh, uh, sicked the dogs on us. Uh, wouldn't, they didn't let go of the leash, they just had them nipping at us uh -huh. to keep us moving. Uh, and uh, so when we got into the actual uh, compound, uh, the guys that were there said, well, you guys were lucky. And, what do you mean? They said, man, uh, uh, yesterday, and uh, every group that's come in, they've run them in the, with bayonets. He said they've had them fix bayonets and jab you with the bayonets as you come in. I figured, well, oh, boy, you're really making a good story, you know. I mean, yeah, <laughs> but, thankful uh, for the dogs, right? right? <laughs> but the next day, the next group come in, there they were, uh -huh. fix bayonets, and they run them in with bayonets. Hmm. Some guys come in with ten, anywhere from ten to forty. Little, little jabs of the huh? bad. Clem, when you checked into the camp, so to speak, at your motel and all, uh, who were you greeted by, or how, how did that work? And you know, who were the people that you ran into well, initially? Uh, most, most of them were Luftwaffe people, uh -huh. uh, and uh, initially we were in tents because they were just building a new compound, a barracks for us to occupy. The camp had been constantly being enlarged. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, uh, the Luftwaffe, uh, even when we checked in, they, they gave us a strip search. And uh, we had some regular army there also. And uh, the regular army were... Uh, German regular yeah, army. Yeah, they, they'd get... Forces. Kick you around a little, you know, uh -huh. and swatch you every once in a while. But not, nothing not really harsh. real bad. And, uh, but the Luftwaffe resented that. In fact, at the interrogation center, uh, when they uh, finished interrogating me, uh, the uh, uh, one elder, elderly Luftwaffe officer uh, came over and put his arm on my shoulder and he says, uh, how old are you, son? And I told him, he says, you know, he says, you're, you're very fortunate. He says, uh, uh, this isn't so bad. He says, it's not the best, he says, but it isn't so bad. He says, at least you'll get back home. He says, I, I lost my son, you know, such and such. He says, here, let me, let me show you where your cell is. And we just had that uh, 
feeling. Uh, if the Luftwaffe pilot could get back to where your plane went down, he'd want your wings. You know, mm. for a souvenir. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. it was just that esprit de corps. Camaraderie of uh, people doing the same uh, basic if thing. We had a, a gunner that opened up on a, a pilot in his chute, and he was immediately grounded and busted. We just didn't go in for that. I mean, the, the, mm -hmm. you figure once the aircraft went down, he was no longer a danger to you. Let him live. And uh, it was just this feeling that we had. Mm -hmm. But now we were in these tents, and they gave us Red Cross parcels, uh, which had food in them. Uh, uh, tuna fish and uh, mm -hmm. canned chicken and everything. Did you get a toothbrush again? No, no more toothbrush. No more toothbrush. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, uh, uh, the commandant, American commandant of the camp. Senior officer. Sen mm -hmm. Well, senior non-com, actually. Senior, you were in a non-com right. camp. Right, Did they split you out? Oh yes. Non -com. Were yes. they officers there or all non coms uh, All non coms Okay. And they, they gave me the choice of going to the officer's camp uh -huh. as an orderly. And I told them, no, I'd prefer going with my own time. Uh -huh. And uh, they, uh, uh, word came down to ditch our tents and then to uh, put the dirt in our hats and take them to a predestinated spot and just dump it so that we would have a pile of dirt there which we all did. And pretty soon we had a nice pile of dirt. And uh, so as soon as the, the unarmed guards that walked among us to see what information they could pick up, we called them ferrets. Uh -huh. uh, as soon as they spotted that, they sound the alarm, called all the other guards back on duty, uh, uh, made everybody fall out, came in with those real long steel spikes hunting for a tunnel, uh -huh. made us empty the tents, and. Of course, there was no tunnel, but it annoyed them and caused aggravation. For I was going to say you gave them a challenge, and that was the thing. Yeah, yeah that sure. was uh, the only thing that they. Could that was do. one of the games but, you could play, right? Well, you figure that far north, uh, an escape didn't make sense because you have to go all the way across Germany. Yeah. Uh, what are the odds of going all the way across Germany? Mm -hmm. Very little. Yeah. So, uh, as a result of that, from then on, when they gave us the Red Cross parcel, they'd puncture the cans. Then you either had to eat it or lose it. Uh huh. Because that, that they figured you couldn't uh, accumulate it to make a, you know, to make an Dig escape. a tunnel or anything, right. yeah. Uh -huh. So then they put us finally in barracks, and when we got in the barracks, the, the next interesting thing that happened was the, we started talking up that there was going to be an escape attempt on a certain date, and it was going to take place at about 10 o'clock at night, and uh, there were going to be six guys involved in it, and so that they would... They weren't all in the same barracks, so they would know who their other people were. Mm -hmm. They were all going to shave their head. And then we get word down, everybody shaved their heads. Uh -huh. So we all shaved our heads. And uh, around 9.30 at night, all the lights go on. It, uh, everybody, uh, Ross, Middlem, you know, get mm -hmm. you out for a roll call and everything. Yeah. And the old commandant comes out there and he says, take off your hats. And everybody pulls the hats off, and there's about 6,000 bald heads shining in the moonlight. Uh -huh. There were <laughs> so, about 6,000 in your camp. Uh, we had it? about 10, but not 10. a lot of them were skeptical. They wouldn't shave their heads. Oh, okay. But uh, he knew he'd been had at that point. Uh -huh. And uh, meanwhile, the guards had all been doubled up again. Yeah, you know, sure. And, uh, they had to come on right, extra duty. Right. So uh, <coughs> he got even with us. He made us stand there for about two hours, and this mm -hmm. was... Uh, in the middle of winter, you know, yeah. bald heads. Did you time. have any heavy clothes issued to you? Or no, how did no. that work? You had just, just a regular had, uniform? I had what we had. And, yeah. uh, uh, they, no uniforms. Uh, I had a, a, a British jacket that I got somewhere. I don't know where I got that. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe from one of the other prisoners or something. Did uh, you have Brits intermingled with you as far yes, as we had the barracks British. and everything? Yes. Mm -hmm. But so you most, got a little history mostly lesson. American, though, but mostly. we did have a few Brits. Uh -huh. yeah. You got a little history lesson on England, perhaps, right. during yep. that time right. there? Yeah, it made us hate England more. <laughs> 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 but uh, uh, then the Russians started to overrun the camp. Mm -hmm. They were coming in we from the East the Prussia area. We could hear the artillery, uh, Russians coming in from this area uh -huh. here. And uh, so they, <coughs> they decided to evacuate the camp. Mm -hmm. So we get the word that we're going to evacuate. Put, take everything that you can carry, and that's it. So uh, on February, I think it was about the 7th, somewhere around there, mm -hmm. we all walked out of the camp. This is 1944? 1945. 45. 
And uh, as we walked out of the camp, they uh, had a whole warehouse full of warehouse, uh, Red Cross parcels. Mm -hmm. They only gave us one for every two or three men, but there was enough there for one per man, which is what it was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And then they let us take it, as many as we wanted. Well, each of us took one under each arm, and I think made almost a quarter of a mile with it before we had to bust it up, take out what we could stuff what in our wanted. pockets and throw the rest yeah. away. Uh, and then we started that, uh, uh, what they call the uh, German Death March. Uh, mm -hmm. That's kind of an exaggeration. Uh, the, uh, the guards were no better off than we were. Were they, once uh, again, Luftwaffe-type personnel? Yes, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and regular army as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, mostly, at that point, it was mostly regular army and old men very old. Mm -hmm. They pulled all the youngsters and put them on the line. Yeah, send them back to and, stop the uh, Russians, probably. <laughs> and we slept in fields, and uh, so if we were lucky, we got in a barn. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll tell you, when you, you go in a barn, and you've got straw there that's mixed with horse manure, and you got a bed down in it, well, it's an experience that you probably never want to go through, but you'll never forget it if you ever do. Mm -hmm. As soon as you do, you get the heat of that manure. Mm -hmm. And that causes a, a clammy type of sweat over the entire body. Hmm. And the body lice really love that sweat. They like that, huh? And so they start playing football or something across their stomach, you know, uh -huh. and, uh, and uh, it's, it's really a miserable feeling. Uh -huh. And temperatures uh, 25, 30 below, yeah. one of the coldest winters uh, Germany had. And uh, we lost, I understand uh, from what I read, that we lost between 12 and 1,500 people on the march. They had us in groups of two or three hundred, mm -hmm. and uh, we moved over across on the map here. We moved over in this direction, and then uh, as we got over in here, the uh, English started to override us. That was so in they, Germany itself? Right. So they doubled us back, moved us south and doubled us back, and then the Russians, they heard them coming again, so they turned us around and moved us back and we surrendered to the English. As a group, you just... As 200 in a group. 200. Yeah. So they, they surrendered to the English, and then we had to make our way uh, as best we could over to uh, uh, Brussels. And in Brussels, they, uh, the English uh, uh, gave us, uh, uh, burned all our clothes, uh, yeah, let us take a good hot shower. Uh, gave you uh, physical or anything? Deloused us. Uh, no, not... not no, no physical. Huh? No, deloused us. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, gave us a British the uniform. British uniform that I was uh, issued uh, when I was liberated, and that I wore into uh, Brussels uh, on uh, VE Day. So, uh, but uh, on were v you debriefed by the British or no, anything? No, no, no. Uh, on VE Day, we were in Brussels. Uh -huh. uh, we were liberated, I think, on about the 5th, and VE Day was on May the 8th. Mm -hmm. it took us three months on that march. And they gave us $10, put us in a British uniform, and turned us loose in Brussels. Uh -huh. And I got to tell you, we were at a disadvantage. There were Americans there. Yeah, with and real American, money. The Americans made out real well, but that British uniform didn't do <laughs> us all that much good. <laughs> and uh, that, that was pretty much it. And from there, they shipped us down to uh, 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 La Havre, France, mm -hmm. uh, Camp Lucky Strike. And there they gave us the physical and uh, put us on a uh, uh, some kind of a limited diet because of our stomachs being shrunk yeah, so right. much. And, and stayed there for a week or so and then boarded the Jonathan Worth the victory ship and headed back to the States. And this was in May, June, this, this was, uh, 45? Yes. In May of 45. In, did you come into Baltimore? No, it took 13 days across the Atlantic uh -huh. and uh, run into some storms. And again, my thought is, I've come through a war, now I'm going to drown. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, we pulled into New York Harbor, uh -huh. and as we pulled up the Hudson, the, uh, all the ships in uh, the, the port there were blowing their Blow horns. their horns and, and everything. Uh, and you the, get a fire boat or two? Or? No, but the little pleasure boats with the gals in the bikinis came out, and they oh. all had... Uh, uh, well, that made you loudspeakers on playing. Don't fence me in. Uh huh. Great. <laughs> and uh, was your ship all POWs? Yes, mm -hmm. it was. Yes. Uh huh. And uh, then they sent us. Uh, they, we docked, and he sent us up to Fort Dix. Uh huh. Gave us a big steak dinner and so forth, and let us call home and try to get transportation uh -huh. home. So. 
Was your mom glad to hear that oh, you yes. <laughs> went flying? <laughs> <laughs> well, she never commented. She on. never made a remark. <laughs> no. She was just glad to have you home, right? Right. Oh, no, no. that's great. Yeah. Yeah. So the uniform that I was wearing when I was discharged, showing the 8th Air Force uh, insignia, my rank as a tech sergeant, and that the uh, recognition that I was a radio operator. These are the 8th Air Force uh, emblems on each uh, lapel, with the United States and the Army Air Force insignia over there, my uh, presidential unit citation, and my ruptured duct discharge emblem. On the other side, I have my crew member wings with the blue background, which denotes that it was a combat crew member, and my um, different uh, ribbons for my various decorations. Uh, down here I have weapons qualification badges and Ar Army Air Force Technical School badges. Well, Clem, we finally got you back home, which is great, and we've pretty much covered what happened to you from the time you were enlisted into the Army Air Corps and got repatriated back to the United States and back to your family and your mom in Baltimore. And now I think we'll move on a little further and cover the rest of your career as it unfolded over the last few Off years. we go into the wild blue yonder, climbing high into the sun. Here they come, zooming to me, tower thunder. At the boys, give her the gun, give her the gun.